And now on the Business Radio X Network, another exciting episode with Jamie Abadev in Connecting Tucson with Jamie. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Connecting Tucson with Jamie Overturf, broadcasting from Tucson Business Radio X, situated in the Stuart Title corporate offices off of Broadway. Connecting Tucson focuses on connecting our community and local businesses right here in Tucson, Arizona and Southern Arizona. Today, we have a very special guest in our studio, Ellen Goldsmith. Welcome, Ellen. Ellen Golden. Olden Golden. Oh, my goodness. I've already made a mistake. We're going to go right there. But now I know why we have the Goldsmith in That's there, right. right? There's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason you can talk about that. But anyways, Ellen is with us today. Ellen's traveled extensively in the United States to Mexico, Great Britain, Ireland, France, Germany, Africa, Tahiti. Gosh, I'm getting jealous just by listing all of these super fabulous places off that you've traveled. We'll get into that a little later. But what brings Ellen to us today is the fact that she is the owner of Goldsmith Real Estate here in Tucson, Arizona. Maybe you've seen some of her advertising out there on some of the benches or some signs. I know I have, but it could be just that I look for those types of thing in my line of business. Um, anyways, Ellen, thank you so much for joining me on the show. And I can't wait to get to know a little bit more about you and Goldsmith Real Estate. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me, Jamie. I really appreciate it. And I, I, I apologize on the Ellen Goldsmith. It's actually Ellen Golden. People do that all the time. My business partner's name is Claude Smith. Smith. My name is Ellen Golden. Like, Hence. Oh, how creative. We put that together and got Goldsmith out of it. So. But that's a creative way to do it. Goldsmith. So now there's that. So as I mentioned in the introduction, Ellen, you actually traveled quite extensively. Is that something you've always wanted to do? Were you in the military? Why did we travel so much? Well, when I moved to Tucson, um, I changed careers and went into the travel industry. Um, It would be in the mid-80s. And that afforded me the opportunity to do a lot of traveling around. Um, Some of it was taking, escorting groups and so forth, but some of it was just on my own. My first overseas trip was with my mother, and we went to Ireland just on a vacation because we have family in Ireland. And so, yeah, we flew into London and drove all over and put the car on a ferry over to Ireland and drove all over there. And and my mom's a really horrible navigator. You know, they have all those <laughs> all those roundabouts. And, and you didn't have that Google search when you were back then, no, right? No, no, not at all. And so, you know, mom has the map and I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. Sorry. Um, and uh, so, mom, at this roundabout, where do we turn? And she'd be like, um... Um, we'd finally just have to pull over and I'd have to look at the map and figure out where we were going. But it was a really great trip. And, and I think that's kind of what, what got me hooked on traveling and it encouraged me to get into the travel industry. Well, I have to admit, I've been to Ireland once and it is gorgeous over there. It is. Of course, I went in the land of when we had the smartphones and, you know, driving on the wrong <laughs> side of the road is a little bit intimidating, mm-hmm. especially if you've mm-hmm. never done it. For me, it's, it's definitely the wrong side of the road. They say we drive on the wrong side of the road, yes. but still at the same point. <laughs> and I'm getting the look from Mark over there, who from is from, else. you know, Australia. From down under. Down, yes. down under. Sorry about that, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that is something that's there. So where is the favorite place that you've traveled to? Oh, uh, you know, Ireland is, is certainly a, a, a very close to the top, but Tahiti, I actually did two trips to Tahiti because I really? loved it so much. I went there with a girlfriend. We went to uh, what they call in the uh, travel industry a familiarization trip or a fam trip. Oh. And so we went down there and said, oh, we should bring a group of people here. So then we did that as well. So, Tahiti. Yeah, Tahiti. We actually stayed on um, Orea. So you flew into Tahiti. Uh, into Papeete, and then you usually take well, a boat or a ferry over to this kind of sister island, and it's um, really oh. beautiful, very lovely. And, you know, I've always wanted to go that and Belize and some mm-hmm. of those like exotic type places, tropical. tropical yeah, I yeah. think, um, although I will have to admit, I did love the breweries and like the Jameson plant in <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> I, I might have went there more than once. I'm not 100% right. sure. <laughs> All right. So on Moorea, they also have the um, oh, no. <laughs> a distillery where they, they, they have the, all the fruit juices and things. And you can go and buy, you know, Ooh. freshly squoze, you know, various fruit juices. But they also, you can buy them with or without the alcohol. I, I well, think now I got to go to Tahiti. There. What I can I gonna say? You're going to have to go yeah. at some point. <laughs> so, well, not only have you traveled extensively, you've also taught travel and tourism classes at Pima Community College, right? Yes. So what exactly, how do you teach travel and tourism? I guess that's my question. <laughs> there, there was a whole program. There actually was a whole textbook uh, oh, really? to go through. Um, there, were, there was a lot to it as far as if, if you're interested in getting into the industry, 
not just the you know the computer system and and logistics and how to you know, search for airline tickets and write an airline ticket and make changes on an airline ticket. Can my ticket. husband attend this class? Well, you know, it's pretty much defunct <laughs> now. So now that there's the internet, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah, the travel industry shrank considerably. And that's when I went into real estate, actually. So, Got it. Well, I can tell you that my husband has still yet to purchase a plane ticket. He, he, he doesn't, he doesn't get the, like he hasn't purchased one himself. I've always purchased them for them. I do all of the mm-hmm. travel planning, mm-hmm. but I seriously think that there still needs to be some type of class on teaching you how to book a vacation correctly mm-hmm. from, you know, doing the hotels, from any sightseeing trips and, you know, actually doing the airline tickets, how to get right. everything going from connecting or, or whatnot. Because all the trips that you see on like, I'm going to say like Groupons or something, mm-hmm. they go mm-hmm. from the major airports from like LAX. Well, we had to Newark. learn all those. We had to learn all the airlines have what they call a hub and spoke system. So you needed mm-hmm. to know what airline, like American has Dallas and Chicago and, you know, United has, you know, Denver and, and, okay. and New York. And so you had to learn so that if you were trying to find a route for somebody, you could say, oh, let me try this way and you could force connections this way and that way so yeah i'm i'm the travel agent in our family as well <laughs> yeah yeah some of these days i'm gonna have to pass the reins but he has yet to even book, <laughs> book one ticket for himself i'm not 100 percent sure i think he's just relying yeah. on me saying no you've got this baby and then he goes to have his drink of whiskey that's how that works <laughs> all right so well not only did you you teach but you also are an accomplished author was this also travel books or what kind of books did you you per, you this, these there. were more hobby books. These oh, were, hobbies. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, genealogical research. So I got hooked on genealogy. I don't know if, you, any, be, I don't know if your audience is old enough to remember the, the Roots miniseries in the 1970s yeah. you know, with Kunte Kunte coming yeah. over from Africa. And it really got me hooked on that. And fortunately, both my grandmothers were still alive then. So, the, And the best thing you can do when you're starting off is try and talk to all your relatives and just write down all their memories, all their stories. And I remember talking you know, around the dinner table with my grandmother and she'd start saying something and my parents or my mother or somebody would say, I never knew that because unless you start asking them, they're, you know, usually don't, aren't real forthcoming with a lot of that information. Especially with what they went through during that time, yeah, depressions right. and transferring over. That's, that's just not something yeah. that no one wants to talk about. But and yes. Ireland was very poverty stricken for, for quite a long, long time. And, and it was not, um, it yes. was not pretty. So, um, so yeah. So that was really interesting. And this is, of course, before the internet and stuff. And mom and I would before take several trips that. to Salt Lake City, and we went to the where the Mormon church is because there they had, held, or hold a lot of genealogical records. And we would go there and look through microfilm and stuff. Really? Now, of course, on the internet, so you can do all this stuff on Ancestry.com. Yeah, or I was going to say that's, there, that's really what it was, Ancestry.com. Yes. But there's some yeah. think there's something else too. What is the there's other several one? different. Different ones, I think the yeah. one, the ancestry ones that has, has the leaf. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I've been, you know, doing that. And then, then you have where you send in your like sample of your actual DNA. We did DNA. Yeah. We did that for, yeah. My, my That's mom. That's completely and different though, right? It's, you can do it in conjunction with ancestry. And so, so like the first book that I did was actually um, for my mother. Okay. Um, I think on her 80th birthday. And so I had put together this whole book and it has, you know, census records and you can find things like. You know, if you found out what ship they came over, because they have ship manifests. Yes. Ancestry also has photos, a lot of those old ships that aren't even in existence anymore. And so you can put together it's this crazy whole how they travel book over here. and a story, and, and it's uh, it's really interesting. So I did one for my mom on her 80th. I did one for Claude's mother on her um, 90th. Wow. Um, yeah, so I've, I've done several of those for people. So I just remember, because I'm my... My ancestry comes from Ireland and mm-hmm. Germany, so mm-hmm. I know a lot about Ireland. I know a lot about Germany mm-hmm. and Sweden. Sorry, Ireland, German, and Swedish. Mm-hmm. I'm a mutt. I'm an American mutt. That's what I call myself. Um, Pretty but- much everybody is here. They don't. <laughs> may, they may not know it, but they are. Yeah, we're all American mutts. Yeah. We're coming here from something. Um, but I, I just remember my great grandmother saying something about coming over on that boat from Ireland, and that just kind of, you know, it was probably like five or six. So you're not really interested. Like, oh, okay, grandma. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go do this. Let's go over here. You know, you're you're, you're more selfish when you're that age. Mm-hmm. When you get, you know, a little bit older, you won't learn some of that stuff. So you know more about you. So that's super interesting. I never knew that. I never knew you were an author. <laughs> and I've known you for a while now. Wow. I know. I know. The things I, the things I learned. So, okay. So let me get this straight. So first off, you're a seasoned traveler. You were a travel agent and you were a teacher and then you were an author and now you just decide to open up your own business. <laughs> wasn't quite that smooth. <laughs> it seems like a pretty smooth transition. So A, do you sleep and B, how did that transition happen? 
Well, so in the around uh, the end of the last millennium, when mm -hmm. when the internet was really booming and the travel industry was totally changing, and so most of the airlines were switching to, you know, instead of paying travel agents to run all these tickets, people could just make their own reservations online. So mm -hmm. the travel agencies in town shrank considerably. There are still travel agencies in town. They're really great. I mean, they probably do more things like. Cruises and vacation group packages travels. and and things like that. Not even groups, but even individuals. But if it's a, it's a package, through, and a cruise is a good example. You know, they still do that sort of stuff. Um, but I just felt like you know it was time to do something else. And mm -hmm. so in the year two thousand, I got my real estate license. Started off in residential real estate. Uh, did that just for a couple of years, and then kind of moved over into commercial real estate, commercial real estate uh, management leasing. Uh, so I did that for quite a number of years. And then just about five years ago, I um, was talking with Claude and, and we'd had some other investments together <clears throat> and decided, you know, we should open our own, you know, real estate brokerage firm. Um, so we had a lot of discussion about that and trying to decide if we wanted to do it and what we were going to do. And we thought, well, let's just try everything. We'll do residential and commercial real estate sales. We'll do leasing and property management for everything. And we'll try that for the first year and we'll see what sticks. We'll see what really works out good. And what we found out is that doing the mix of everything is a really good format for us. Oh. So for instance, we had a client who, um, she uh, owns a business in an, um, an office complex and they're, they're called office condos because each you own actually each you know, office. So you have your own real estate. And she said, oh, the office next to us is coming up for sale. Can you help me buy that? We might want to expand at some point. Sure. So we got her to buy that office. And then she said, well, you know, we're really not ready to expand right now. Could you get find a tenant for us? Sure. So we found a tenant, leased space for them. That tenant who was relocating here from another state, we also helped them buy a house. Wow. And then she also said, well, I don't really want to manage my own tenant right next door. It seems like that would be awkward. <laughs> so could you manage that property for us as well? And I said, absolutely. And she said that was so great. There are not too many companies in Tucson where you can do all of those functions yeah. with one person or one company. So it's been a good mix for us. That's good. Well, I'm just not sure how you do it all or you manage to do it all, but I know I need to step my game up at some point and like, got to match you. <laughs> That's how it's going to go. Um, so, okay, real estate. Uh, you obviously did not grow up thinking real estate. So was that something after the travel, how did that pop into your head, real estate versus going, because going from travel to real estate really isn't like, I guess it's not seamless. Not a lot of it's similarities. Not, there's not similarities in there. So I'm like, what made you say, okay, real estate, that's what I want to do. Um, and how did you get started? You know, there, there's some similarities in that it is a sales position when you're, okay. when you're you know, in the travel industry, mm -hmm. that's, that's sales too. And we, I did a lot of, a lot of speaking with, with groups and, and corporations. We did a lot of corporate incentive travel. So there's, it is a sales position. Real estate also is a sales position. There's some people that get into it because they're like, ooh, I just really like, you know, looking at houses <laughs> and, and showing houses. But it, let's face it, it is a sales p position. Mm -hmm. You are selling something. You're helping them buy that. You're negotiating. There's other negotiations even once the property is in escrow. Um, so th there's a lot to that. Um, and I... I I don't really know what the connection was. I, I know I had taken some time off, you know, just to kind of rethink what I wanted to do. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to just try this for a while and see how it works. And it just worked out really well. So I've been doing it for like 20 years now. You've been doing it for a while. <laughs> yeah. I just I just happen to know that from travel to real estate, there's really not a, a nice little bridge. <laughs> it's not a common leap. It's not a no. common leap. And real estate is not easy. Especially in the past 20 years, all of the ups and the downs that you've had to incur That's to true. stay in business. Yes. So, and so it's, during it's a rough recession. industry. <laughs> it is. It can. It can be a real roller coaster. The one nice thing is that Tucson doesn't have quite the peaks and valleys Not that, volatile. say, Phoenix does. Mm -hmm. So it has really big peaks and people are making a lot of money. But when it, you know, in the recession, whoosh, it really had mm -hmm. more of a peak. So we certainly had huge peaks and valleys, but it's not as bad as, as a larger metropolitan area. Okay. Um, but also because, you know, doing property management, the company that I worked for just before opening my own company, um, we did a lot of property management and uh, a lot of, and it was strictly commercial. So it was just um, mostly just retail and industrial centers. Mm -hmm. um, during the entire recession, my division, which was my department, was the um, was the property management department. We never took a dip in income at all. 
Wow. So if you looked at a graph, even though it was during the whole recession, and even though in property management, a lot of times your income is based on the rents that you collect and people were going out of business or larger chains were coming in and negotiating lower rents because of the recession, even though that income went down, we were taking on more and more properties and our income level went up the entire time. Oh, that's uh, phenomenal. Recession. So it's nice to have a mix that you have something else. You have something that can go on. there. So right. let's just jump into it. Tell us about Goldsmith Real Estate. What, <laughs> what, what is there? Well, besides it being the, your one-stop shop for, you know, sales, leasing, and property management mm-hmm. for residential and commercial properties, um, it's, um, I, I'll, I'll back up and, and say that our, our, our real formula or our, um, I can't think of what the word is. I'm trying to think of, you know, our philosophy, I guess, Mm -hmm. is that if you could helping people first, the money will follow. So we always feel like, you know, we want to help people. So say in a residential sale or, or, you know, for the purchase or sale transaction, real estate's a big ticket item for most people and it can be really stressful. So our goal is to try and really work with people where they're Every step of the way, let's try and make it as smooth and as drama free as possible. <laughs> um, and which sometimes during negotiations and stuff, people can get emotional mm-hmm. on both sides. Um, so I, I've, I've had someone say, Oh, well, we want to make you know this kind of really low offer on this house, let's just see if they buy it. And I, I'll say, You know, the problem with that is because I've seen it happen <laughs> is you know, you'll make a really low offer and you may offend them. And so even though you may, so then they may not even counter offer you and you may mm-hmm. go back with a higher offer and now you've already kind of turned them off and they're just not even going to respond to you. Mm-hmm. So there, it's an, it's an emotional transaction and, um, you, you know, you need to really help people through all that to make it, there, there is a way to make it a win-win I feel for everybody. So I, I, and here, let's just talk about that because mm-hmm. I've actually, I've sold a few houses, you mm-hmm. know, well, I've not sold them personally, but I've used them and I've had a lot of people come in mm-hmm. and give that low ball offer mm-hmm. because they're like, oh, they just want to sell. I'm like, no, mm-hmm. we don't need to sell. Like mm-hmm. I don't need to. I don't think I've ever felt that, you know, I can't counter offer, but let me ask you that. Is there a sweet spot? Like let's say a house, depending on a house, whatever we're talking to personal property like a house is for sale for four hundred thousand dollars and you see these estimates all the time on like zillow and what redfin and whatever those other ones Mm -hmm. are they're like oh it's 380 Mm -hmm. so if like those estimates are pretty close they're at four hundred thousand, and you counter at 380 is that too off because that's almost twenty thousand dollars difference percentage wise that's not that much though okay oh yeah i guess you know if you're if you're talking about you know a a much lower price property like 320 two hundred thousand (laughs) dollar house and you're doing twenty thousand less well that's like ten percent less yeah a four hundred thousand dollar house hmm not so much. Okay. Um, and it and and every home is different. Yeah. And every market is different. Um, I'm not real big on the estimates. I don't really feel that they're <laughs> that accurate. I don't think they're that accurate either. I'm sort of like, but they, how do they come up with that? Well, you know, they're just <laughs> crunching numbers that are available, like from the assessor's office and, oh. and so forth. But, and when you look at that, you're not really looking at okay, this house sold for 30000 more than this house. They'll just go, okay, we'll just take an average. Well, maybe one house had like a really phenomenal view and the other one or did Or nice not. upgrades. Or really a lot of nice upgrades and the other one hadn't been upgraded since, you know, 94. So, yeah, they don't take that into consideration. So you can't just kind of take an, an average. When I go through and I'm doing comps or comparables for a neighborhood, I'm going to look at all of those things. I'll make notes on them. And I don't just let the – and there, believe me, there are tons of – for computer formats and, and logarithms that you can pull up all these figures. I don't usually do that. I want to go through and I want to look at what's sold in that neighborhood the last six months and really find out what exactly has sold in there. Cause that's what an appraiser is going to look at probably the last six months um, and find out, gee, Oh, this one, you know, had granite countertops, had the stainless steel appliances. Oh, it had all the new hip trendy things, a walk-in shower, really nice pebble deck pool and a mountain view. Great. The one right across the street is not going to have that same view. And if they mm-hmm. haven't done any of those upgrades, like since it was built, even though it may be in excellent condition and, and wonderful, it's at, you're not even looking at apples to apples. No. See, that's great. See, I always wondered how they came up with that because I'm sitting there going, that doesn't seem right. You know, like, I don't, it, yeah. it can be a good jumping point to see where things are. True. But when, you know. True. To me, you're to, better off calling a realtor. <laughs> that's kind of what I was thinking, but I was like, how do they come up with yeah, that? How, yeah. how are they doing that estimate? I yeah, don't know. They just look at numbers, but they don't necessarily account for um, so, very 
variables. We talked about this. You've you've been in Tucson for 30 plus years, but you've been doing real estate for over 20 plus years, not all on your own, not mm-hmm. in your own brokerage. Um, and you've done both residential or what I call personal and then commercial real estate. So, A, what are some of those key differences you've seen between the two and do you prefer one over the other? I really like that doing a mix of everything. Okay. Um, I will say that with commercial real estate, you probably don't have quite the emotional factor. Yeah. It's not their home that they've lived in. And so all you know, the people, memories, people are a little more, you know, there's a little bit more detached transactional, right? It's, it's more of a business transaction. Um, but when we manage a variety of, of, um, of businesses, I mean, large shopping centers, office complexes, um, we even manage a fraternity house at the U of A. That one's a real adventure. <laughs> I can bet. <laughs> that one keeps you us get busy. get some weird phone calls? Very busy, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love when the kids call up and they say, well, something's wrong with my door. And you go there and they busted it in because they, you know, lost the key or they couldn't remember the lock. I don't know how that happened. Or they'll say... Um, it was like that when I got here. Right, I right, promise yeah. you. Someone broke the window. Well, the glass is on the outside. I think you broke it. I know, <laughs> right? Know? So, yeah. So, anyway, that's always... We just call it billable hours and, oh, and move along. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm gonna, so yeah, so there's, we we do quite I a variety. I share a couple of them properties, and I can tell you they are they are rather interesting. <laughs> they are. They keep you on your toes. It's an adventure. That's, I know. That's all it is. So we talked about some of the products and services you offer. What does what are some what are all of the products and services that Goldsmith Real Estate offers? Gosh, okay. Well, that would be a long list. I'm gonna, and I'm I'm going to focus a little bit more on the property management because I'm, okay. I'm thinking most of your audience probably understands. Okay, sales. Yeah, buy and Re- sell. Yeah, okay, buy and buy sell. And sell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I mean, there's a lot of variables, especially with, you know, 1031 exchanges and things like that, but I won't get into that. Leasing, um, or and which is more related to property management. Not all the properties that we do leasing for, we manage, mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. So we, someone may have, oh, I have a building I need you to find a tenant for, but then we're done with it. You, know? you don't do the property we management, don't do the once, management. You, once you lease it out. Right. Um, but um, all of the residential, we do more commercial than residential, uh, but the residential property management... Um, there's actually a real shortage of property managed uh, rent residential homes, I will say, like single family homes right now. Uh, what we had found with our inventory is that during the recession, people had a house that maybe um, they were at a point where they wanted to sell it. For instance, we had a, a really nice home in, in Sam Hughes. They bought it for their kids uh, while they were going to college. They all finished up college right when the recession hit. And, uh, oh, so then the bottom dropped out of their price. So they didn't want to sell it, you know, and they don't, obviously don't want to turn it back over to the bank or take a hit on their credit. So they're like, well, I guess it's going to be a rental property for a while. So they may turn something into a rental property for a while because it's income. Hopefully they're at least breaking even with their mortgage. They, you know, a lot of people were refinancing. Um, it's a good write-off, a tax write-off. But now that the markets are up, a lot of people are like, okay, when this lease is up, let's sell. And mm-hmm. so we've had several properties do that. And then we're scrambling, trying to find those tenants. We've been trying to get them to either buy a home of their own uh, or get into another rental property. And that's been a challenge. So there's kind of a shortage of, of homes for lease right now. Mm. Um, on the other hand, with commercial property management, that's almost sort of an ongoing thing. We have a, a lot of properties that have some some vacancies and um, um a lot of different zoning, so different needs and different businesses that can go in there. So that's, and it's kind of nice because it's a real mix. So I mean, mm. if you put this all together, every day is different <laughs> every- <laughs> because because you're not doing the same thing every day. Um, but as far as commercial property management also with, um, it's a lot more complex. So usually with a shopping center, you're going to have a budget. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a budget for 2019 and usually a share of those charges are passed on to the tenants. They're pro rata share. So if they're leasing a space, it's 5% of the shopping center. They're going to be responsible for 5% of the operating expenses for that shopping center. And you might hear them referred to as triple net charges mm-hmm. or camp charges, something like that. So it's going to include property taxes, insurance, uh, landscaping, parking lot lighting, parking lot maintenance, mm-hmm. you know, painting, things like that. Um, so you have a budget for all of those things. And then after the first of the year, we look at what was our actual expenses as compared to what the budget was. So let's say we build the tenants based on budget. Actual expenses might be higher than that, might be lower than that. So we're either going to debit or credit those tenants. We've already figured out, hopefully, by then what our 2020 budget is going to be. And we'll say, okay, now here's your new monthly CAM rate for next year. 
you have you have this credit or or a charge mm -hmm. and move along and there's a lot of of um owners out there who think well you know we can we own this property and it's been the family we can do this but they may not really have that strong of a feel for budgeting and stuff and no. if you're not recouping those expenses you know generally if you've got any vacancies you're not recouping all of the cost anyway because Exactly. You know, only, you know, the tenants are just paying their their share based on their square footage, and then you have the uh, open and square it, footage that you exempt have to uh, absorb. Exactly, that's a landlord expense. So, yeah. so it's complex. So we can do all that uh, nice. that sort of thing. Love it. So, in a nutshell, you're more than just a property manager, and then you're also more than just a leasing or sales. You you can do it all. Just we, give you a call. We can juggle it all for you. Yep. When, juggle when, it all. Give you yeah. a call. And if people are sick of you know. Uh, Tenants calling and, and at 3 a.m. saying, oh, you know, there's a, a there's roof a leak, leak or there's a leak. water leak or there's, you know. That's a, where a property had, manager comes in. We had in. a shopping center that had an arson fire on Sunday mm. over Memorial Day weekend. Oh, no. we, we get the call. So we go over there. We handle it. We contact their insurance company. As, you, as you're very familiar with. I do, yeah. yeah <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't one of yours. I know. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's why you hire somebody. And especially for maybe re even just residential owners that maybe aren't all that familiar with the Arizona Landlord-Tenant Act. Um, mm, you know, yeah. you need to think about that. Um, so, Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that think that they can just purchase three or four homes and mm -hmm. then they can be the landlord for mm -hmm. them all. But that's a lot of work and a lot it of upkeep. Is. It is. And making sure mm -hmm. you're up for with all the laws. What if, you know, a tenant, you, you know, is not paying? How can you evict them legally. correctly? Legally. Exactly. Correct. There's a lot of different right. questions that are out there. So, right. yes, right. don't try to do it yourself. If you have a question, call an expert, and uh, I suggest calling Goldsmith Real Estate for some uh, advice. Um, so, well, obviously you're doing something right because your business is growing and expanding. I see your picture out there and your <laughs> your signs and logos out on not only commercial park benches and there's like everything, TBS, bus benches, TBS, yeah, 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 TBS. Yeah, I've yeah. seen them all. So, and I think I have to account this to the fact that not only are you and Claude phenomenal, but you hire great staff. The people I um, I've most recently worked with Tori, and she's wonderful as well. So. That actually leads me to my next question. Like, how do you find your agents and the people that work for you? Like, you know, other, in, you obviously offer them some other stuff other companies don't. How do you find them and how do you keep them and how do you retain them? Uh, yeah, Troy has been just a fabulous property manager. I mean, I wouldn't be able to even do this anymore without her because we have grown uh, kind of beyond our own um, expectations and plans that we had for the company. Um, a little over two years ago, we even bought our own office. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought we would rent for five years and then buy something. And that, so that's been way ahead of schedule and hiring people. So we hired a full-time property manager about a year and a half ago. And then just this year, we also hired a full-time maintenance person. And we have a maintenance van with our, you know, signage nice. all over it. So, um, so yeah, we, the, the format has worked. And I think there's two things. One, besides the philosophy of, you know, Put helping people first mm -hmm. and, and everything will be fine. <laughs> right. Um, it's also that we take a much more personal, hands on, face to face um, way of doing things. So, um, so for instance, when my agents, um, I said, if you're representing either, either a buyer or a seller, so you have the listing out of MLS and it'll say this, that, and the other thing, don't take any of that information as gospel because. People can make mistakes. You need to double check everything in here. Um, you need to go on county records, verify that is it in a flood zone? Is it um, uh, is it actually hooked up to the sewer? Now, and I, there was a famous mm. lawsuit. Some oh, this is many decades ago, but there was an agent who listed a home in the foothills and said it was on sewer and it sold. And then the people who bought it some years later called out a. Um, plumber to say, oh, you know, there's a problem with this, you know. And he says, oh, it's no big deal. You just need your septic tank pump. And they're like, we don't have a septic tank. And this was a pricey home up in the foothills. Mm. And a lot of those are acre properties that have septic tanks. Yes. And they're like, no, no, yeah, you, you're, you're on a septic tank. And they sued the agent and she had to pay to have the sewer run to that house. So I said, you don't want to do this. You don't. <laughs> and I don't Cross know that your, your E&O insurance your... is going to cover that because that was more negligence. So, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. So I said, you know, really go into detail. Look at it yourself. Don't just take someone else's word for it. Same thing when we're interviewing tenants. I mean, other, you know, other than a, a new complex that we just took on that has a really high delinquency rate, um, which we just took on a couple of weeks ago, all the other properties that we... Uh, the residential properties, we had no delinquencies. 
And a lot of that is because when we're interviewing, we actually physically interview people. We actually have they fill out an application. We do a background check. We ask them to come in and sit down, or at the very least, if they're moving here from out of state, we have a phone conversation with mm-hmm. them. But there's a much more of a relationship there. So you're developing a relationship with obviously the landlord, but also the tenant. Um, and we just really want to make sure that you know our our they understand all of the complexities of the lease, and if they have any questions, what don't you understand? Um, I know. <laughs> the, the house that we leased in that same Sam Hughes neighborhood. Um, we uh, had some tenants in there, but then we got some grad students that wanted to lease. And the owners were mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't know. We said, well, it's grad students. They're different than undergrads. So mm-hmm. let, we'll interview them and, and make sure um, because mm-hmm. they're like, I don't want any problems with that. No, that's okay. So they came in and they were three, um, I think, math grad students and I think at least two of them their focus was more in astronomy and stuff mm-hmm. and anyway they seemed very adult and responsible and so we did say well here's the deal though if you guys get one red tag you're out of here and they they all said what's a red tag and we said you guys will be just fine <laughs> and a red tag if you don't know it is when you get tagged from the city usually it's for like it might be for underage drinking mm-hmm. or loud partying or something like that and they put literally a huge red tag on your front window so the fact that they didn't even know what a red tag was I really didn't even well know what a red tag was. So I'm like, seriously, what's a red tag? Yes. Like, and I got a red mic in front of me, but is that the same thing? Is that the same thing as a red tag? So if you don't know what a red tag, to me, that's that's good. That speaks well of you. Like, okay, well, I had no idea. But that's, that is, I don't, there's not too many other management companies that even do that. A lot of them, everything is very automated now, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. You, they don't even show the house to the person. You you call in with a credit card number. They give you a code for the key safe, They have the lockbox, and they go it's when they walk so in. It's so impersonal. I'm they so, pay, you well, know, online and they do all this and they never meet them. So we have much more um, personal relationships and I feel that that's what really helps us keep our delinquency rate down. Well, I can tell you, no wonder you're doing great. You have that personal (laughs) touch. Your agents that you train and hire are also doing great. And, you know, it's one of those where you're training them in your ways, being the personal touch, making sure that you do the interviews. You want to develop a relationship because here's the thing. If you don't develop a relationship with either tenant or the landlord and you're sitting there trying to collect money, they're going to be you know more likely to dodge you if they don't know you. But if they know you, right. like, oh, okay, you know what? I know her. I'm going to be a week late. Maybe if I just let her know, I'm going to uh-huh. be a week late. And keep I know in she'll be calling. Yes, she, she's <laughs> going to be calling. I'm just going to give her a call and say, hey, this is what happened. Right, you know, right. You're more likely to work with somebody as Absolutely. long as they communicate. Same with Absolutely. me. Absolutely. I'm more likely to work with somebody to say, hey, I, you know, something happened with my bank account. Something's not going to happen until next week. I need seven days. All right. That's fine. We right. can work with you. Just right. talk to us. We're not all mean. You know, we're not just here to right. collect that almighty dollar, but right. we do. We, we have feelings, too. We've probably been through it all. So. And everybody's had some emergency come up exactly. in their life. Everybody gets that. But we yeah, communication it. is what really gets you through all that. I know. Yeah. Don't just, yeah. don't put us on yeah. radio silence. Just talk to us. <laughs> right. Come on. Right. Well, you know, so interesting. And I have to say your approach to property management and your agents is just so refreshing. The fact that you take that personal time, you take the time to, you know, talk to them, interview, set up and do all of that. If you're just turning, tuning in, you are listening to Connecting Tucson with Jamie Overturf and Farmers Insurance, where we focus on connecting our community and local businesses right here in Tucson and Southern Arizona. Is your local insurance, insurance professional for both personal and commercial lines insurance needs? And a small business owner myself, I know how important it is to make new and lasting connections in our own community. You never know how a new connection will create a spark or pull you in a direction you weren't even thinking of, like real estate. If you are a small business owner or involved in a community project and you'd like to be featured on this podcast, please feel free to give me a call. All of my information is on TucsonBusinessRadioX.com, and I would love to hear from you and your story. Today, we're talking to Ellen Golden, the owner of Goldsmith Real Estate a unique real estate company here in Tucson, Arizona, which focuses not only on property management, but leasing and sales for both commercial and residential real estate. If you're a small business owning a few buildings or an individual looking for some help and guidance around your property rentals, or just have a few questions or need a little help to get you to the next level, check them out. All of their social media links and website information will be on Tucson Business Radio X underneath Connecting Tucson with uh, Jamie. So first off, what do you like best? Best about what you do, Ellen, now that we're getting back. What, what's the favorite thing about doing what you do? I think, as we discussed before, not doing the same thing every day. It's not, you know, if, if you 
you've got this real variety of, of business going on, all the different avenues that we handle. You're doing different stuff every day. But also um, the, the people. I think in real estate, you really have to be a people person mm-hmm. and like talking to people, be comfortable talking to people. And I have to, I'm going to pause right here though and say, you, Ms. JV, me, <laughs> what I do? Her, you've been a great help. And you've helped several of my tenants now, the commercial tenants especially. They have to get insurance coverage before we'll give them the keys to the premises. And also some of the property owners that we have that own commercial properties. We've been able to rebid out their annual insurance right. premiums, and you've given them good deals. So you've been a really great oh, asset. Thank you. So thank you for doing both residential and commercial insurance coverage as well. It, not all of us do. So, yes. No, and it's, a, it's a, <laughs> great to be able to talk with somebody who, who knows what they're talking about when you say, okay, I need like, you know, a million per and a two million aggregate and this, that, and the other thing, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Exactly. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, with, um, with agents. You know, you'll, sometimes you'll get residential you know, uh, real estate agents who, who are trying to do commercial and don't and then, really know and, what they're doing. And are, are, you know, or maybe they may be new to it, but, um, but yeah, you'll say, Oh, okay. okay you have a, a possible tenant for here. Well, great. Why don't you pop me over an, L- an LOI, you know, and we'll mm-hmm. run it by the owner. We'll see. And they're like, what's, what's an LOI? LOI? Yeah. So it's like, okay, you need to go talk to somebody in your company. <laughs> That's when I get <laughs> we'll the like, oh my gosh, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so it really is. It's great, Jamie, to work with somebody who, who really knows your stuff and you've been great. Well, thank so. you. I really appreciate that. So I have to say, I, I focus a lot on people too. And I have the same type of motto. If you put helping somebody first over your business, you're going to get a lot of referrals and a lot of repeat business. And I know you have that same mm-hmm. motto. Mm-hmm. For me, I always tell my stuff, you know what? Put yourself in their shoes. You want somebody that's going to help you. So try to help them out. If we can't help them, be mm-hmm. honest with them. Just say, we can't help you. Mm-hmm. But here, we might have a few other places that can try these. And then in six or eight, six months to a year, we'll try to come mm-hmm. back and get you back. But they'll remember the fact that, A, we educated them. B, we tried to help them. And then when mm-hmm. we call them back, it's not so hard of a, a lead. They're like, oh, yeah, you did help me versus, oh, we can't help you. Sorry. And hang up the phone. That, in right. my right. my opinion, is, okay, I've just closed that door or burned right. that bridge. I'm mm-hmm. not able to go back. You, mm-hmm. you never want to close mm-hmm. a door or burn a bridge. You always want to try to leave things open. Now, there are certain situations where you're like, all right, it's time to burn that bridge. <laughs> That's true. There's and times they, when we fight, we've all fired our clients. Yes, yeah. We were like, okay, and you are now fired. Like, <laughs> but but also, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's great to be able to, to be honest with people, you know, much as trying to think of an example, like, you know, you know, we'd really love to sell that house for them, but after talking with them and what their issue is, you, we've actually told people, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for you to sell. You know, you, you, I think maybe you ought to hang on to it. I think you ought to. It, and we had someone, it was an older couple, and they wanted to sell the house and buy a new construction. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, and we were just saying, I don't think, to be honest, I mean, I would have gotten a double deal. I would have sold their house, but helped them buy mm-hmm. the new one. We're talking, you know, half million dollar homes. And, you know, I was just saying, you know, I think you guys ought to sit down and talk to it amongst yourself because I don't know that the pros are outweighing the cons here. Mm-hmm. I know it's it's kind of tempting thing. Oh, you'll get a brand new home on you know a smaller piece of property, but I think you might be better off just hiring people to take care of. You know, it was mostly mm-hmm. just the they had like an acre, and so a it was like just too yard much work. yard. Yeah. Then you might be better off and more comfortable because now you have that home like just the way you like it, and mm-hmm. and it's not like they had you know a two story home that they couldn't navigate anymore yeah, or something it's like harder, that. Yeah. It was really just the yard. You know what? You, you know, for what a few hundred bucks a month, maybe get somebody to take care of the property. Exactly, and you'll be fine. And 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 much as I would have loved to have done that, just for the the money end, you don't want to you know yeah. want to treat people right. And I know when it comes time to that, they do need to sell the house. They'll come to you. They'll come back. Yeah. You know, so that is just so true. You know, I love being able to help people and you know helping them with their businesses too. However. There's a flip side to that. I think it's more challenging us for us specifically because as we're always trying to help other people, you know, sometimes we, we forget to help ourselves and do that work life family mm-hmm. balance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's hard to take off that work hat when I get home and relax. How do you do it? Alcohol is usually. <laughs> I love <laughs> woman after my own oh, heart. I have to say, you know, you know, uh, Troy, our, our full time property manager, has been a lifesaver. I just, um, I would not feel comfortable leaving town oh, if I didn't it, know yeah. that she was there to really pick up the slack and, now and you can take go care travel? of things. Yes. So, um, so yeah, so that's been been great. Um, and I just think that um, again, I think having the relationship with the clients. You know, I don't have to worry about the, you know, the tenants so much. They, they, they get the drill after the while. Like they know 
if something is wrong, call us right away. Mm-hmm. We'd rather take care of it because maybe they were used to somebody really not taking care of mm-hmm. stuff or they, they would, you know, they might Get have a, run like around. a leaky toilet and they would want to charge them for that. I mean, I think that's just normal wear and tear. There's no reason the tenant should pay for just a simple little repair. Now, right. if they've broken something, you know, that they've broken in the house, that might be something else. Yeah. How did that countertop get shattered? Um, you know, something yeah. like that. I but don't I, know. A uh, sledgehammer or something? I just like, yeah, it's going to, except for than the college kids, that usually doesn't happen to me. Yeah. Often. But uh, but they know if they, they you know they feel comfortable they know that if they call we're going to take care of it where we've even had we even have um, several portable air conditioner units because you know in the middle of summer when it's 110 and oh. everyone's AC is going out sometimes mine went out this year you can't get somebody there right right you then can't. because it's happening to so many people across Tucson so we'll bring over a portable AC unit so at least maybe just at least their bedroom is cool exactly um, you know and especially if it, if they're elderly if they're small kids you know we'll at least do something to get them through that because um, and that's a we lot. get it yeah. yeah I remember my AC went out this summer you offered that for me I was really happy but I do have a handy husband who was able to <laughs> uh, to jerry rig the AC but now that a lot of those ACs no longer, the uh, Freon, that Freon mm-hmm, 22 is mm-hmm. not going to be easily accessible, mm-hmm. we're thinking about actually upgrading our, yeah. our AC unit. But we'll have to yeah. figure that out. So, yeah. well, you're doing a fantastic job. I think I've said that many times. Um, and we did talk about how the real estate market is not as volatile here in Tucson, but there are still some up and downs. What would you say the market's in right now? And you know, a recession? Is it booming? What what are we what are we looking at as far as uh, the real estate right now here in Tucson and Southern Arizona? I think we're still in in a really really strong market. The okay. low interest rates are are really great. They're really helping borrowers and people are uh, not a, not just buyer, borrowers, but people wanting to refinance their homes. Um, that's been a big thing. I've had yes. a lot of people call me and say, we're refinancing. Literally, I have probably a, a request for an EOI every other mm-hmm. day saying we're refinancing. So I can, that's pretty yeah. good. You know, I actually came out of a closing at a, at a title company just last week. <laughs> and it, and I, there in the lobby were, were clients that I just, we just sold them a house a year ago. And I was mm-hmm. like, are you buying another house? <laughs> like without me? No. no and they said, refin- no, 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 we're refinancing. And they, it was just a year ago. And they said, you know, we're going to save like $150, $200 a month. I can't remember what it was just because nice. the interest rate had, had dropped quite a bit. So Excellent. so the, the low interest rates are, are really keeping the market going. Um, it's still a seller's market because there isn't as much inventory out there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if you're, if you're thinking about it, you know, feel free to give us a call. We'll give you a free uh, valuation of your home and, and, you know, see if that's something that, uh, if, nice. you, if the time is right for you. Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, so here's something, and you've mentioned this too. There are so, I was just talking to somebody today and I can't remember who it was, but they're like, there's some 4,000 real estate agents that are actually somewhere in Tucson, Arizona at some point. But only like 400 of them are actually practicing. There, there's really a lot of real estate agents out there, but not a lot of property management companies. The competition has got to be tough. What do you do to set your part, set, set yourself apart from the competition? What does Goldsmith Real Estate do to set themselves apart from every other real estate and property management company out there? there and I, you're right. You're exactly right. There are not that many property management companies. Um, and the Department of Real Estate is really strict when it comes to property management companies. And okay. I'm sure you're aware that, oh, how many years ago was it? There was a property management company in Tucson oh. that absconded with about a million dollars worth of people's, yes. you know, maintenance reserves and security deposits and rents. And, I remember and that. And they're, they're like, That was on. a huge scandal. Yes, it was huge. And so um, when you're a real estate company that has that does property management, which you have to notify the Department of Real Estate about, and you have to have trust accounts, and we actually have a bunch of trust accounts. So we'll have like separate trust accounts, like a separate trust account for this shopping center, mm-hmm. a separate a bank account for the for this center. Um, you know, simply because it's easier to do the bookkeeping that way. And exactly. so we'll send them, here's your bank statement, so you know how much is in the account. So we send monthly reports. We send them their the um at least on the larger commercial properties, their bank statement. Obviously, mm-hmm. if it's the smaller, you know, a one-off house or one or two homes, you can have building that in one that's trust in one, account. Generally, yeah. in, right. in one trust account. Um, and we, but we do manage a lot more commercial than we do residential. Nice. Um, but yeah, we send out, um, you know, reports every month. We send out your bank statement every month. We're, we also have a lot of really good um, contractors that we use a lot. Um, mm. And so uh, we have one. <laughs> 
a gentleman who does our, our HVAC work, and he and, and if I may, I put a plug in for him. He's Absolutely, great. Edwards Heating and Cooling. He's been so good, and he does both commercial and residential. And I have one um, commercial client who owns you know quite a few properties here in, in the Tucson area. And we, he, if he had units, oh, we need you know a couple units over here. We need units over here. He's given him such great bids just consistently over the years. He doesn't even bid out anymore. He just says, yeah, have Eduardo give me a call. <laughs> I, mean, oh, I, need, I need a few more units on this for this new tenant that's going to move it in. Oh, um, great. So, yeah, so plumbing, you know, electrical, there, it's electricians, so things like great that. great when you find somebody you can trust yes. and keeps giving you consistent bids. Absolutely. And they're also, when you do a lot of business with them, yeah, in the summertime when, when you really need to pull strings, they say, you know, we got to get you over to this house right now. They have like, you know, their elderly mom and they have a baby. Like mm-hmm. put them at the top of the list and they will, you know, if you, you know, tell them. Because you give them so much. Because absolutely. you give them so much business. Sure, they really... Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I bought my own uh, new HVAC unit for my home <laughs> this year. And one of, the, one of the things I was going to tell you about the, the HVAC is how much more energy efficient they are and yeah. how you're going to save on your electric bill. Okay. We were renting an office uh, before we bought the, the office that we're in right now. And it was a smaller office, but it was older and had an older AC unit. And so when I was crunching my own budget, okay, we're going to buy this building. It's a bigger office. It's got more square footage. It's got two AC units. And I'm running my budget. Then I'm like, I think, budgeting more for electrical costs and so forth. Our electric bill was so much less oh, wow. <laughs> than the smaller space with the older AC unit because yeah, they're so much more energy to... efficient. Yeah. Now that we're getting Call past Eduardo, the summer, I'll, you all right, I'll get you. A, you'll have to give me Eduardo's number. Yes, absolutely. But at the same point, I'm thinking, you know, now we're in the cooler areas, so now's the, probably the time to get it versus the peak of That's you know, Ari- you know, Arizona summers. We all know how yeah. those those can be. Which I did too. I, I had planned on buying my my new uh, AC before summer because I knew it wasn't going to do another yeah, summer, no. but it actually died in early this year in the winter uh, <laughs> so nice which nice. was unexpected but oh well at least it was over and done with and that was that yeah. well that's great um so are there any special deals or offers that you have for our listeners yes well besides the um we'll certainly do a, a free valuation of your home that's something that that we always do for folks okay um right now we are offering new property management accounts either commercial or residential we'll do that with no setup fee Oh, nice. So and how much can, is their setup fee usually? Well, you know, it depends on the property, but it can be, you know, it might be just a couple hundred dollars for a larger commercial property. It could be more. So it just that's depends just on the yeah. number of tenants, how complex it is, and so forth. So that's something that we're running now, probably through the end of the year at least. Great. I'll make sure to go ahead and post mm-hmm. that on my Facebook and make sure we get that offer out there on everything as well. So Thank you, ma'am. Absolutely. Um, so in all seriousness, you do work hard, you know. Um, but work is not everything. So what do you like to do in your oh, free yes, time? That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, what do you like to do in your besides, free time? Besides go home and, if have, and, when and you put have my anything. feet up with a cocktail. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 you know, <laughs> if and when you do have any free time because you are a busy lady. Um, you know, I do try, you know, you spend time with family. Um, okay. and you, and you, I do try and at least have some downtime. I, I, you know. We're, I'm on call 24 seven because especially when you're doing property management, you just have I to know be how that is. But, Accidents you know. don't just happen Monday through Friday from <laughs> eight 30 till five 30. I wish, but they wish. Don't. we all wish. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, keeping in touch, you know, keeping in touch with family and keeping in, uh, you know, my mother's going to be 90 next month. Wow. And, um, she's in assisted living, but you know, I try and go see her every Sunday nice. and have some lunch with her and, you know, maybe bring her some flowers or something. Aww. And, She's just, you know, really into her bingo and everything. But, I, you know, I just think it's really important to spend spend time with her because she's not going to be around forever. That's, um, that's But fantastic. also with your, your significant others, too, your immediate family. You've got to make time to do that, whether it's, you know, maybe just a, a, a date night or just, you know what, let's – and just put it on the calendar as if it was an appointment. You know what, this night we're not going to do anything. We're just going to, like, stay home and watch a movie or something. Because I'm going to pencil you, don't you it, in, honey. Yeah, but you kind of have to do that because yeah, yeah. you know what your schedule looks like. It's like, I mean, my own schedule. It's like every evening, some no, more early morning you. meetings, all this stuff. I hear you. So you've got it. You've got to just pencil in some personal time. So yeah. you just kind of have to do it. Well, we're getting to the close of the show, and I just want to make sure that we touched base on everything that you wanted us to. Is there something that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that our listeners know about or did we cover it all today I Ellen? Think you've covered you've done it all Jamie I've done it all all right <laughs> well um there you have it uh, as she mentioned there are a couple offers they will do a free valuation of your home and for new property management out there either commercial or residential give them a call no setup fee they're going through that for the end of the year just mentioned this podcast will be happy to do that for you 
So, well, that is all that we have time for Connecting Tucson with Jamie here at the uh, Stewart Title Corporate Offices. If you'd like the show, please let us know. You can get to know a little bit more about Ellen and Goldsmith Real Estate by going to TucsonBusinessRadioX.com and clicking on Connecting Tucson with Jamie. As always, don't be afraid to step out of that comfort zone and make a new connection. You never know where it might lead. Until next time, keep on making some unique connections, Tucson. Have a great day.